Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zhuang. I'm uh, the technical lead in the Business Tools team in Rakuten Viki. I hope everyone has been excited enough and hyped after everything met here today. Okay, so uh, let me continue with some other talk regarding to Ruby. So today actually my first time ever speaking outside of Rakuten Viki. So most people in the community that haven't seen me before. And also especially uh, even our friends in Rakuten haven't seen me talk about something else besides ping pong or football. <laughs> okay. So it's a good chance for you to know what I uh, learn about, like what I'm doing. Okay, so, so in the Rakuten Viki, we work hard every day to bring happiness to millions of users. And, we, and why don't we give ourselves happiness and satisfaction while doing it? So maximizing, maximizing software development, productivity and satisfaction is one of the top priority at Rakuten Viki. So today I'm going to share with everyone our experience of working as a team in a large code base written in Ruby. We will first talk about what's the, prob uh, the problems that we face, the principles that we use, and the approaches that we taken to resolve these problems. Okay, so every, in the end of the day, we are all have, like, happy Ruby developers. Okay, so um, how many of you know about Rakuten Viki? Okay, great, it's like more than I expected, but... Uh, Okay, um, so Rakuten Viki is a streaming, uh, video streaming platform that differentiates ourselves with our competitors by having subtitles being contributed by our communities over the world for different languages. And we also try to make our, the watching experience of our users to be more exciting by providing engaging features like time comments, discussing forums, Zoom piece as a source for your news and all the gossiping. Okay, so um, a bit away from my team. I'm working in a business tools team where we touch we touch every part of business a busy a part of Viki business. We provide support. Uh, we build the whole content content injection pipeline of Viki. We provide support for uh, web application for our internal users, for our partners to deliver content to us, for our community to contribute to Viki, and all sort of things. So all of this actually is written in Ruby. Yeah. So I don't think anyone question about performance. Okay. <laughs> So we started this uh, project like five years ago during Ruby on Rails, which is like, I think three point something. Then we got upgraded to the like, latest version of four, like 4.2.6, upper 10, sorry. So um, I think the reason we started with like, all this like more like political reason, but like because Ruby is very nice to read and write. And it's implementing extra fast in comparison to like other strong uh, other languages like Go, Java, or Scala. It also gives us uh, the capability to write beautiful interfaces that can be read like English. You know, how beautiful is that? So uh, as we get where we get more features into our projects, the code base start getting larger and larger, and we have a, then we have a large code base. So what is the problem of having a large code base? Yes, it's had a lot of code. Yeah. So when you have a lot of code, is you have too much thing to read. You have a lot of thing to know. And navigation within your code base becomes a challenge, a real challenge. And now add the human factor into this picture. We got people come from different backgrounds, having different experiences, having, uh, following different conventions and having different styles. So a single piece of code can be written totally different uh, in a many different way. So you start introducing an overhead. Oh, sorry, man. You start introducing, you start introducing a lot of overhead when we read, you need to read other people's code and even your own code after a certain period of time, if you don't follow certain conventions. Okay, so let's add Ruby into this picture again. Ruby has all sorts of uh, uh, goodness, loose typing, flexibility, metaprogramming, no compiler, awesome. You can, uh, generate, you can generate code on the go. But like without a, a proper way of doing it, three of these adding together, a team working on large code bay written in Ruby, Will create, will potentially make your code base into a mess that we usually call legacy code. Okay, so and we do, and in Viki we and we're going to okay never mind. So all that adding together, we introduce development costs. That's the cost of looking for code. That's the cost of reinventing the wheel because you cannot find the code. That's the cost of reading and understanding the code. That's the cost of having bugs in productions, of course, and that's and the cost of fixing the bugs. And let me remind you that development cost is actually equivalent to financial cost to a company and engineering satisfaction. 
And at Engineering and at Rakuten Viki, we totally don't want that. So let's uh, talk a bit about uh, the principle and the criteria that we use to tackle things along the way. So you can we'll start seeing this keyword that I keep going again and again within my talks. Okay. So let's go back to all these costs. You can start seeing that looking for code, reinventing the wheel actually because of poor searchability of the code. Cost of re reading and understanding code, of course, for readability, and all this is because of debuggability and silent failure. Okay. So um, first thing we're going to tackle is maximizing predictability of the code. So um, when you have a lot of code, you don't really read code, and you totally don't want to do that. So it would be great if you can do a job by reading minimal amount of written code. And it would be greater if you can, if we, we, without <coughs> writing that piece of code, you'll still be able to predict what are, how, how the code being located, how, uh, what's our interface, what are the arguments being used, and you can use the method as if you are the one who wrote it. How cool is that? You're going to, over time, it's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, okay. So before we start writing any piece of code, we always ask ourselves, if the code is not written by us, would we expect the code to be there? Would we expect, the behave, uh, would we expect it to behave in that way? Would we be ever aware of all the side effects that are going to create? Okay. So always set expectation before we, we write any piece of code. The second thing is maximizing readability. So as assuming you take five minutes to read and understand 30 lines of code, every time you encounter that, you need to keep doing it over and over again. And times number of people in your team, over time, you accumulate a very huge cost for the organization and your own dissatisfaction. So before we do anything, we ask, how, after we read or write the code, we ask how much time it needs to understand this plot of code. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so that's why we try to differentiate ourselves we, we work together here in Viki, Rokuten and Viki as a team in an organization. We try to differentiate ourselves from a group of people that follow different conventions. So we have our own we have our common conventions to achieve our common goals. Okay, so con convention over configuration are very common terms in uh, Rails world. Yeah, so I don't need to explain more about that. So I will first talk about like how we're going to make all this like maximizing searchability searchability, readability, predictability in code structure and code readability, and all the sort of namings, cross-context passing, strong typing and declarable. Okay. Okay, so let's start with single responsibility. When we structure our code, we try to define as many as possible singularly responsible components. So for example, you can see here models is a data schema where it only, it only, it only have the attributes of the data objects. Store is the way you pull, uh, you, you read and query the data models. Repository, and there's no side effect at all. So, uh, repository is where you create, update, destroy the data model. Controller is API. Presenter is only taking model and generate a JSON, XML, and whatever sort of uh, presentations. And, and each of this, I think in your, in your application, you will probably have some of these components. So the, the, the great thing about having a single responsible components are you just read a name, you know what it does. You know what is behavior, what is there. You don't even need to go into a file. So for will just say user model. You know that it only contain the attributes, the schema. So about store, you know it got method called find, query, and stuff. Repository have no update, create, destroy. Okay? So make it much more predictable when you when you read before you even come into a file. And you and okay. So let me give a very uh, example of uh, what is not singly responsible. So active record base is a very common component of Rails. So actually, it's actually uh, ORM on this one. It have an attribute, it has relations. You actually have, you can mutate the object on its own. You can, it actually has data uh, uh, database asset layer where it can pull data and per persist data onto database. It, and, and, it's, and more awesomely, it has all the OOP behaviors. Okay, so there's no way you can predict when you before you walk into a active model file, active record file. There's no way you can predict what is there. And once you cannot predict things, you can't reuse anything. Okay, so active record base actually equal to model, store, repository, parser, validator, and, and other stuff that I mentioned in the previous slide. That's why in in, in our team we try to limit the usage of active record base just as like model and, 
and using the CRUD layer inside store and repository as the implementations. Uh, and some other reason we are going to mention during the talk. So good so far? So far so good, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so when, we have, when you already have all these single responsible components, all of them can, cannot form an uh, application on its own. So we use, we use purpose-driven, single responsible service objects to contain our business logic layer. It's just like a higher, module, higher level modules that combine our, our, lower, our lower level objects. Okay, so let me give you an example of how we implement things using that. So this is a very traditional way of writing an uh, active record model. When I want to verify emails, send verification emails, but once you have that kind of capability is here, right? You can have anything else. You can have you just sing a song, going into the toilet and stuff. So you can't predict anything from here. So we, we, we write in using a service. So, we call, so this service only do one thing, verify the user. So we can name it user verification service. So it's so the, so you're going to take user as the attribute uh, attribute assessor, uh, attribute reader. We need to have the same implementation as this case. So by splitting the logic to a service, we can keep the models thin and single responsible as what is supposed to be described. And one more awesome thing, so let, me let me remind you that we are talking about a large code base. When you're inside a large code base, file fuzzy search is your best friend. No one search for method, everyone search for file name. By having purpose, business purpose inside your file name, it makes it much easier to search. So when I want to, for example, I'm new to the team and, and my boss tell me to uh, modify or read about the user verification logic. What I need to do is type user verf and the code will come up. So you, this will significantly improve the searchability of the code. Okay? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. This is a bit not a real method, but like we also apply single responsible to our methods. So by our definitions, uh, a single responsible method means it only implements a single feature, like sending a request, passing a string or whatever, or it can control the flow of other singly responsible methods, or it prepares arguments for a method, for a singly responsible, responsible method for a specific use case. Let me give you an example of the third one. So I asked my colleagues to write a migration uh, script to migrate all the finance role from the old, from the old group of roles to a new group of roles. So it's a code being written. So it takes a lot, quite a amount of time to find like what's happening here, even like just by English alone. So by rewriting it here, you can read it just like English, which is pretty hard to do in another language. So you can read like my great finance role actually you go to my great role from the old roles to the new role. Okay. So it's much easier for, for it significantly improve the readability of the code. So this actually only prepare the arguments for this method, which actually can generally apply for everything, for any group of uh, sort of uh, arguments. Okay, so let's move on to code readability. So just so far we've done with like predictability and searchability. So inside the loose, loose typing world, service uh, name, uh, descriptive naming is your best friend. It's the only thing that can tell you what is there. Anything for you to expect before you do something. Okay, let's start with service naming. Um, so for example, I want to create a service that do subtitle import, uh, to import subtitle. You're going to name subtitle service, uh, import service. You're going to take all these arguments because this doesn't have any scope. So it, so it means that it gives the expectation that it doesn't have any scope. So you need to pass in arguments. So if I, wa I want, Subtitle import to belongs to a specific videos. I'm going to add a scope in. Okay, and, it, and it, it, before I walk into this file, it's going to give me expectation that videos is the attribute reader of this method, of this uh, service. And I can, I can use all this uh, method without passing parameters. Yeah. Okay, so method naming. Uh, yeah, method is. It's uh, pretty much the only way you can know what this me that methods do. So it's supposed to have actions. It's supposed to imply argument types and quantities. It's supposed to imply sort of return type and quantity. So I'll give me an example, fetch users. You're going to imply that it's supposed to return an array of user. Fetch user, supposed to return a single object of user. 
for what I, if I have an object that mutate the users, I say disable users. When I use it in another context, I immediately know that it's supposed to take in a user a array of users at argument. So, so you're going to give like more expectation as you read the code or use a try to reuse a method. Of course, there are boolean boolean method that is like have question mark at the back, which is the best signature of Ruby. That's why I'm not mentioning. Um, okay, variable naming, which is a very common case. Okay, I'm going to move on to. So Ruby gives us the capability of write code as read that read like English. I can say here it's like it's a capability. You can choose to do it or not. Okay, so let's give an example of this. Um, so uh, pagination is something very common in a controller. So we decided to write a paginate method to take either an active record relations or an array of objects. And we don't need to care about like what object type it is. So we can just use it easily inside our uh, controller. So let's look at uh, how paginated items being written. So, so if the object, if the, if the items is uh, active record relation, I'm going to use paginate method of active record. Else I'm using Kiminary. Okay, because Ruby is duck typing, so we can, can just check for the, use respond to to check for the uh, capability of paginate method inside this. They look pretty fine, like a very common Ruby code. So, but like, but like one month from now on, when I walk into code again, the question I'm going to ask myself is, why am I using paginate here? Okay, so it's taken me like five minutes, I think it's longer, to like, no, okay, cool, it's actually because it's active record related. So I actually, so I rewrite the code, uh, and add an immediate variable that is like become more descriptive. So at four, like one month from now on, I'm coming back, okay, I got roughly idea like, why am I doing this? Okay, so actually you can take, actually you can take one step further to make the code look even more like English. So it, the patient I tell you go to if it's record relation, I'm using active record, else I'm using chemistry. Okay, perfect English. So actually this will save a lot of uh, so instead of struggling reading code, uh, in Rakuten Wiki, we rather spend time to create more values to our customers and some other meaningful stuff. Okay, so so let's come back to uh, the requirements again. If the record, if the items is active record relation, we use active record pagination. Else, uh, if, if it's an array, I'm going to use Kiminari. So if I'm passing a linked list here, what's going to happen? Okay. It's actually going to be paginated using Kiminari. Which is going to, it might work. Okay, I don't say it won't work. It might work. But you pass something that's similar to array, but it's slightly, the implementation is slightly different from array. You're going to, it's you see the code still works. You still get whatever you want. And, but it's, it's going to be slightly different in, in production and going to take you a lot of time to debug. Why is it happening? So, so in VQ, in we try to be more descriptive about what we support and what we don't. Okay, so if, if you only want to support collections, array, the rest will just really not support it. Until we encounter it in, in the real scenario, either in, in production or in, most of the Ruby code will break in production before we know it. Yeah, so, uh, so, so yeah, only support what support to be supported. So we can have less side effect and no silent failure. I'm going to talk more about silent failure uh, later in some other examples. So one another challenge of working with Ruby is crossing context data passing. What I mean is, is when, the, when you declare a function in a place and you use it on another file. Okay, okay, so let's look at this. Now I want to create an upload method to upload a file, take body, path, and expires with all this uh, interface. So now in, so I'm going to use it somewhere else. Just imagine you don't have this inside your, your view and you write your, your consumer code. Right, right. So for some reason, you know, for, like, for some mistake, you switch the place of these two. Your code, your specs still work. Because inside your consumer code, very likely you're going to mock this upload method if it's actually sent out an upload request. So there's no way you can, be, be, uh, you can notice that your code is actually breaking. And you just say, why is it not uploading? Then you check, okay, why is, it the, why is the EOS look so different? Keyword methods are your best friend. Huh? Sorry? Keyword methods are your best friend. 
Uh, yes, down here, yeah, down here. I'm coming to it. <laughs> okay, so one, uh, 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 one step to make it to be slightly, slightly more predictable is because this one actually got different in type. So we, we're going to use some... Uh, we, so I think everyone starts talking about like strong typing in Ruby. So we start applying it in Wiki, so it's like gradual strong typing. So we don't want to bring all the, all the inflexibility of strong typing into Ruby. Gradually is good. Okay, so, so this is how the code looks like. So if you wrongly flip this, even you will know, like why? Okay? But if you flip this too, it's still no way. It still works. Okay, but, okay, uh, so another way is using name argument or we call hash argument, which is a, a very cool feature that introduced in Ruby 2.0. Yeah, so this will make the code become much more predictable. So this one, you will, very likely going to make a human mistake here, unless you're really drunk. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So it, this going to uh, this will actually become this will be very perfect in this example. But as you everyone do upload, you know you're going to start adding on and on and on more options, more more customization into here. So if your argument list is actually larger than five arguments, you're going to become a bit bulky. So the normal way of people doing it is using hash. And hash is the most awesome thing here. There's no way you can identify what the... You, there's no way you can know like what is the key type. Is it a string or a symbol? And what are the keys that you have? Be, except you are the writer of the method. Okay. So one of the ways to solve it is to document it. Okay. You still know what is here. Look pretty okay. So like just imagine this method need to be... Uh, this argument need to be passed over and over again through multiple layers. Controllers to service to service to service to service. You need to keep documenting it over and over again. And you don't want to do it. Because if you change something, you need to keep doing it over again. Okay, so in Wiki, what we do is for this kind of very specific purpose thing, okay, always purpose driven programming, is we, we use a value object. And we add one more thing is we write our own strong typing library which is we are still POC with our code, that's why we are not introducing it on the, the community yet, so don't ask about it. <laughs> so, okay, so um, by having it here, by having it as a value method, a value object, and having the strong typing, uh, like gradual strong typing here, you, when you walk into here, you will roughly know like, what is there, and what, what for you to use. And it's much easier to use a like, uh, like attribute rather than using a hash key to access all the data. So whenever you need to use it, you need to document it with like this class. Yeah, so the code, the code documentation will be much structured and it's much easier to know what it is. Okay. Uh, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so let me keep on one uh, more context about Wiki. Wiki is following uh, uh, microservices architectures. So our, our, our uh, application is actually just a microservice within the whole ecosystem. So we take data from multiple APIs and from external APIs. So if you need to keep, go, if you want to know what data and set up response, you need to keep over, come to the documentation of all those over and over again. So just the number of team members you have, you're going to cost a lot of extra time. So by having, so we usually will just document the, docu the model of that third party APIs or, or even the internal API within our code, just the model itself. So we, when we want to use it, we know what is there for us to use. And even, so the, and the better thing is, we actually use the internal tools, right? Internal tools, we are the, we are the only input of all the data into Wiki. So our, we play our role as a gatekeeper, trash in, trash out, so like the bad content coming in, bad content coming out. So if, so if someone change the contract, like what they're going to give us, and we don't have like any kind of validation, enough validation, they're going to break our code silently. And we don't want that to happen here. So, Strong typing actually help us to, to guarantee our code uh, to be more reliable, at least in terms of document, self documentation and, uh, and validation. Uh, I think feature documentation is roughly similar to the one I'm talking about, uh, pagination. Yeah. Do you know what it is? So, uh, so, so, we, so, so far, we all talk about predictability. And exception and predictability never coexist in anywhere. 
So if, for example, like if you someone say, I just want to add this verify method into the user model because a user is supposed to have a verify method. I just want to add this. This is the only one. But once you make it an uh, exception, there will be more exception coming in. And once there's exception, there's no way you can predict what is there inside that user model. So exception is the, the thing we always say no when we write code. You can make the thing to be flexible somewhere else, but not inside the uh, higher level code. Okay. Okay, this is what everyone wants. So all the things I have been discussed so far, it actually based on all this base requirement where you assume linter is there, specs is there, and code review are there. Is there, sorry. Yeah, so this is so the thing I I assume that every good code base and organization will have. Okay. So this is the summary. Ruby is an awesome language. That's why we have like hundred plus people gathering here today to see maths. Uh, Ruby is flexible which is awesome, but it requires very, very good discipline to make it a proper code base. It's just like your cell doc, a cell a managed employee where your manager is not looking. Okay, so, so this is all of this that, I'm, uh, that I go over. over. The convention over configuration, consistency is key. Predictability, I think you're going to save your ass. Searchability will save your time. Readability will save your time. No silent failure will save a lot of your time. Okay. So, so I think that maybe people will start talking like we are. I'm talking a lot about like strong typing. Why am I not? Why are we not moving to like Go, Scala, Java to enjoy all of that? But yeah, I think uh, that is just a very very minor cons in all the goodness of Ruby. We'd rather overcome that cons and enjoy the goodness of Ruby. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Okay. You're developing your own validation library, your type validation library. Okay. Have you taken a look at, say, the dry RB project recently that in the last six months? Okay. <clears throat> have you taken a look at the dry RB project and a couple of equivalents lately? Like in the last six months or so, dry RB has significantly improved their validation library and uh, it is in terms of just validating a type, validating that it meets specific criteria like uh, match like not just a string but a string that matches a certain regular expression or so on. Uh, I'm 39 years of experience makes me extremely leery of writing tools in-house when adequate or better tools exist off the shelf. Okay. So you can ask any. Uh, I'm Jeff Dickey. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for your questions. Okay, so, okay. so I think the great thing about Ruby, we have a very active community where people keep sharing the goodness that they created in the, their own code base. So, uh, Vicky will soon to be there. Okay, so, uh, so let me come back to our... Uh, okay, so actually uh, every, like, every solution will fit certain problems or like scale of problems or scope of problems. So in, uh, when we started this strong typing, actually we started two years ago. Okay, so that at the time, dry Ruby, dry Ruby is not even there. It was Virtus. It was it was Virtus. Yes. It was uh, strong, strong typing. Oh no, it was it called typed. I guess I remember that like, it called typed. You're not wrong. So we go through that, and the and the interface was some somewhat lacking of what we want. So let me show you what we meant to when we. Give me one second. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, my son. Okay. Okay. So this is one of the example. Of, okay, I can go make it bigger. So one of the example of how of how one of our model look like. Okay. So actually, you can see here. Um, so actually, we got an option called uh, a thing called options. Okay. And at that time, there's no one giving you a choice of a have option. It means that it can be nil. And, and I think one of them is doesn't give the option, and one of them uh, and some other defense, and one of them 
uh, how to convert your data into the, the declared format, which we don't want. Like, for example, if you pass a string, for example, you pass uh, a page, assuming you have a, a pagination model, where you have page as integer, and you pass like a string one, it will auto pass it into one integer for you, which is the thing that we don't want. We only want this as a self documented things and as a self validation uh, to encapsulate the validations. And we also like, so we just want to see something very simple. We just want a very simple solution is checking type, give applicability for option, for like, uh, it can be new. And we get ability for, this is more awesome, array. Okay, then at that time there was no solution else that give us all of this advantage. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's why we decided to ourselves. And regarding dry RB, dry RB actually is a very good uh, consideration to come to all this of uh, improving Ruby to, a, to be a more predictable code base and stuff. Uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment it's become a bit too big right now. Like you can choose a like, different combination of all their sub, all their like uh, smaller libraries. Like you got like dry, uh, dry type, dry validation, dry, dry struct, something. Yeah, I think if someone started and would like something that have more powerful and flexible, you can use that. But for us, like having this here right now is give us like more control first. Yeah, you have two years of experience with this. That's yes. Very important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's roughly why we started doing this and why are we still using it? Right. Okay. Any other question? I guess not. <laughs> okay. Thank um, you. Okay, so we, I just want to open up the floor to 